One of the most interesting things about boxing, in my opinion, is examining fighters who don't get a lot of praise from the mainstream boxing media, but who may have been considerably better than advertised. At this point, it's become a bit of a trend on this channel, examining the careers of fighters who are not generally that well regarded. Boxing history is filled with guys like this, fighters who were able to challenge and in some cases beat some all-time greats, but never had the promotion, style or charisma, as well as the fancy looking record on paper to impress the casuals who might not know any better. One classic example of a fighter who fits this description in my opinion is the Jamaican former light heavyweight champion Glenn Johnson. Nordic Warrior here, hope you guys are all doing well. Welcome back to my retrospective boxing series. So Glenn Johnson is a fighter that doesn't have an impressive record on paper. In fact, if you take one look at his record, and if you didn't know any better, you would consider him a journeyman at best. He had quite a few losses at several stages of his career, and was only really considered a world-class fighter for a short time during his mid-30s. Nonetheless, he was actually one of those fighters who was considerably better than his record suggested. He was a late starter to boxing and a guy who lacked the kind of amateur pedigree and background that most fighters who saw even a fraction of the success that he had, usually had. He started boxing at 20 years old and was more or less thrown in at the deep end, being forced to learn on the job. So Glenn Johnson turned professional in 1993. He took up boxing part-time while mostly working as a labourer in construction. He began his career in the middleweight division and in the early days of his career, fought mostly journeymen in America. Alternating between the middleweight and light heavyweight division on various undercards. After 32 straight victories, he received a surprise shot at the IBF world middleweight title against the future middleweight boxing legend Bernard Hopkins. It proved to be a step too far. Johnson put up a spirited effort and gave the champion some issues, but as the fight went on, the more experienced Hopkins took Johnson to school and forced an 11th round stoppage, giving Johnson the first defeat of his career. After losing to Hopkins, he moved up to the super middleweight division and took on the seasoned light heavyweight contender Murky Sosa. Sosa was moving down in weight, while Johnson was moving up. The fight was fairly competitive, with Johnson having a lot of success in the early rounds, However, as the fight went on, the size, power and strength of the much bigger Sosa started to take effect, and Johnson started to really struggle. Johnson also received nasty swelling above his eye early in the fight, which impaired his vision in the later rounds, and he took a bit of a beating. Nonetheless, he fought his way to the distance, losing a very close unanimous decision, giving Johnson the second defeat of his career. After losing to Sosa, Johnson came back the following year and took on the fringe contender Joseph Kiwanuka, losing by a highly disputed split decision, giving Johnson the third defeat of his career. Johnson decided to go back to the drawing board and settle into his new division a bit. After four straight wins in a row, he received his second world title shot, this time against the IBF world super middleweight champion Sven Ocke in Germany. And once again, Johnson, despite the massive golf and experience, put up a pretty decent fight, having some success in the early rounds. But once again, just like in the Hopkins fight, as the fight went on, the more experienced Otke started to figure him out, completely taking over the fight, winning by a clear unanimous decision, giving Johnson the fourth defeat of his career. Johnson returned to the ring just two months later, losing a very close decision to the highly ranked contender Sid Vanderpool. Despite having two losses in a row, just a few months later Johnson received a surprise shot at the vacant WBU title, travelling over to Italy to take on the seasoned contender Silvio Branco losing by a controversial unanimous decision. He then returned to America in a crossroads fight against the young contender Omar Sheikah. Most observers felt that Johnson had done enough to win, but some people had Sheikah winning. Officially, Sheikah was awarded the majority decision victory, giving Johnson his fourth consecutive defeat and the seventh defeat of his career. It seemed at this point like Johnson's time at world level was at an end. Despite always being competitive, Johnson had lost all his major fights and was developing a reputation as a journeyman. Due to his willingness to fight on the road against anybody, he gained the nickname The Road Warrior. He had one more fight at super middleweight, travelling over to the UK to take on Toxa Woe, stopping him in the 6th round, before moving up to the light heavyweight division. He travelled back over to Germany taking on the undefeated WBO Intercontinental Champion Thomas Ulrich, knocking him out in the 6th round. 
The following year, he moved up to cruiserweight, taking on the fringe contender Derek Harmon, losing by a unanimous decision. He then moved back down to light heavyweight to take on the contender Julio Cesar Gonzalez, once again losing by a controversial majority decision. He then had a controversial draw against the American fringe contender Daniel Judah. This once again set Johnson's career back since he now had to contend with back-to-back -back blemishes and you would never have expected him to go on to become world champion. Nonetheless, he persisted and got a shot at the IBF USBA title against the American contender Eric Harding, winning by a wide unanimous decision. He then received a surprise shot at the vacant IBF world title, his third title shot, this time travelling over to the UK to take on the popular British contender Clinton Woods. Johnson handily outboxed Woods for the most part, though the fight was competitive in spots. Johnson appeared to be the clear winner. However, in a pretty shocking decision, the judges scored the fight a draw, leaving to the title remaining vacant. Even the British fans, for the most part, conceded that Johnson should have won. The two had a rematch just a few months later, and this time the fight would be even more one-sided. Johnson completely dominated Clinton Woods, winning by a wide unanimous decision finally becoming a world champion in his fourth attempt, something that seemed very unlikely just a few years earlier. For his first title defence later that year, he had the biggest fight of his career so far, taking on boxing legend and pound-for-pound -pound star Roy Jones Jr. Jones was coming off of a knockout loss to his rival Antonio Tarva, and was considered to be on the slide. However, despite this, he was still a massive favourite to beat Johnson, with many fans thinking that his speed, power and skills would be far too much for the relatively crude Johnson to handle. In a massive upset, Johnson went on to dominate Roy, backing him up to the ropes in every round, outboxing, outworking, outfighting and schooling Roy, putting on maybe a career best performance and one he's most remembered for. Johnson knocked Roy out cold in the ninth round. Despite beating Roy, many fans pointed out that Tarver had knocked him out cold already and that Johnson merely finished the job. He didn't receive the credit for the fight he felt he deserved, and Tarver was at that point seen as the best light heavyweight in the world. In order to prove himself as the man in the division, Johnson vacated his IBF title to negotiate a fight with Tarver. The two would fight for the vacant IBO world title at the end of the year. The fight was fairly competitive, but for the most part Johnson was in control. His superior work rate and educated pressure got the better of Tarver down the stretch. Johnson won the fight by a very close split decision, but a clear win in my personal opinion. The two had a rematch the following year, which resulted in another close and competitive fight, but this time it was Tarver who made the adjustments, outboxing Johnson for stretches of the fight. Antonio Tarver won the fight by a close but clear unanimous decision, giving Johnson the 10th defeat of his career. A few months later, Johnson made a comeback and fought in an IBF title eliminator, defeating George Khalid Jones by a 10th round stoppage. Before getting a shot at the vacant IBA world title against Richard Hall, Johnson dominated Hall, winning by a wide unanimous decision. He then got a shot at the IBF world title once again, travelling over to the UK to take on his rival Clinton Woods. This time the fight was actually very close and competitive, with both men having their moments. Woods was awarded a split decision victory that many fans disputed, in my opinion, the fight was very close and could have gone either way. I personally think Woods deserved the decision. After losing to Woods, Johnson got another title eliminator, this time against former champion Montel Griffin, stopping him in the 11th round. After a couple of knockout wins against Fred Moore and Hugo Pineda, he got another world title shot, taking on the WBC champion and undefeated rising star Chad Dawson. Johnson was once again a massive underdog. He was 39 years old at this point and was considered a high-level journeyman. In what was almost a shocking upset, Johnson went on to completely school and outbox the much younger and much bigger Chad Dawson and appeared to win the fight very clearly. In another shocking decision, Dawson was awarded the unanimous decision victory, giving Johnson the 12th loss of his career. Johnson's post-fight interview was epic. After an easy knockout win over Aaron Norwood, and then a unanimous decision win in a rematch against Daniel Judah. The following year, due to the controversial decision in the first fight, Dawson agreed to give Johnson a rematch. However, unlike the first fight, this time Dawson made some adjustments and he completely schooled Johnson, giving him one of the most one-sided defeats of his career up until that point, and giving him his 13th loss. 
this time by a wide unanimous decision. There was some speculation at that point that Johnson might be coming towards the end of his career, since he was getting old and clearly showing signs of decline. Nonetheless, he continued his career and got a shot at the fringe contender Yusuf Mack. Johnson stopped Mack in the sixth round after a dominant performance. He then got another world title shot, taking on the undefeated IBF champion Tavoris Cloud. The fight was very close and competitive, with both guys having success, and it was a back and forth brawl till the end. But Cloud appeared to land the cleaner, more effective punches, winning the fight by a close but clear unanimous decision. Johnson was 41 years old at that point. After 14 losses, it seemed as if any chance of him continuing at world level was gone. It seemed unlikely, at least. Nonetheless, just a few months after losing to Cloud, he received a surprise opportunity, being offered a chance to replace Mikel Kessler in the World Boxing Super Series at super middleweight, a division Johnson hadn't competed at in years. How Johnson was able to make weight so quickly, I don't know, but somehow he did, taking on Alan Green in the quarterfinals of the tournament. Green revealed that he and Johnson were actually friends and former sparring partners, he also admitted that Johnson had gotten the better of him in sparring. Nonetheless, Green was a slight favourite to beat Johnson. In a minor upset, Johnson went on to win the fight, somewhat controversially. He hit Green on the back of the head in round 8, knocking him down. The ref counted it as a knockdown, and while Green protested, he was counted out. Foolish move by Green, since he was apparently ahead on the cards and still in the fight. Nonetheless, Johnson progressed to the semi-finals of the tournament getting a shot at the WBC champion Carl Froch. Johnson was 42 years old at that point and naturally was a huge underdog, with very few people giving him much of a chance to beat Froch. Nonetheless, in another surprising performance, Johnson went on to give Froch one of the hardest fights of his entire career, outboxing him in the early rounds and backing him up with ease. However, as the fight went on, Johnson began to tire and Froch, who was the much younger, more athletic fighter with superior stamina, started to take over the fight. The fight was very close and competitive throughout, with Froch winning by a majority decision, giving Johnson the 15th loss of his career. After losing to Froch, there was some speculation that Johnson might either retire or return to the light heavyweight division, which clearly suited him more at that stage of his career. Surprisingly, he decided to stay at super middleweight, getting a shot at the undefeated IBF champion Lucien Boutet in Canada. Just like Green, Butte was a former sparring partner and a good friend of Johnson's. Speaking of sparring, in one of the worst performances of his career up until that point, Johnson basically did nothing all night, giving Butte little more than a sparring session. Butte won every single round, winning by a wide unanimous decision. Unsurprisingly, leading to calls for Johnson to retire. The following year he returned to light heavyweight, losing a wide unanimous decision to the Polish contender Andrzej Fonfara. Johnson announced his retirement immediately after the fight. However, later that year decided to come out of retirement, moving back down to super middleweight, going back over to the UK taking on undefeated contender George Groves. Johnson was utterly dominated by Groves, losing every single round and even being knocked down in the 12th, looking a shadow of his former self. Over the next couple of years, Johnson moved up to the cruiserweight division and had a few easy wins against Journeyman, before taking on the dangerous cruiserweight contender Alunga Makabu for the vacant WBC international title. Johnson was stopped in the ninth round. This was the second stoppage loss of his career, the only other being his first loss to Bernard Hopkins way back in 1997. Later that year, he moved back down to the light heavyweight division taking on undefeated Swedish contender Erik Skoglund over in Denmark, losing by a unanimous decision. He then returned to America the following year, and had his final fight against the undefeated Turkish prospect Avni Yildirim, for the vacant WBC international silver light heavyweight title, losing by a close and competitive unanimous decision, retiring shortly after. So that was a pretty intense career breakdown. Talk about a roller coaster career filled with ups and downs, twists and turns, and plenty of interesting and competitive fights to talk about. So how good was Glenn Johnson? How would he have done in today's era, or any era besides his own? Let's talk about it. So Glenn Johnson was one of the toughest, most durable fighters of his era, and in addition to that, he was genuinely willing to fight anybody anywhere, truly earning the nickname of Road Warrior. He also had a career that spanned across a few eras, taking on several world-class fighters, 
and even becoming world champion when it seemed very unlikely that he would do so. Unfortunately though, despite his toughness and his competitive drive, he was never really able to reach the highest level of the sport. He had a great jab and solid boxing fundamentals, but was never the most intelligent fighter, often unable to make adjustments down the stretch. This may have had a lot to do with the fact that he was a late starter to boxing and didn't have the amateur experience. That would have helped for sure, and would have given him a bit more hype in his early pro years. He also took many fights on short notice and, since he was usually in his opponent's backyard, he never had the politics on his side. I think he was a very good fighter who had the potential to have been great, but there was just something missing from his game. Maybe the kind of boxing IQ that a lot of all-time greats had, he just didn't have it. Nonetheless, he would have been a really hard fight for anybody between middleweight and light heavyweight in my personal opinion. He would have always given them a tough fight. And in his prime, he always came to win. Thanks for watching guys. I really enjoyed looking into the career of Glenn Johnson. Let me know what you guys think. Stay tuned for more retrospective boxing videos. I have a lot of them coming to the channel in the near future. Thanks for watching and God bless.